Welcome to Easy Stories in English, the podcast that will take your English from okay to good and from good to great. I am Ariel Goodbody, your host for this show. Today's episode is something a bit different. Rather than doing an episode by myself, I sat down to work with Alistair Budge from the English Learning for Curious Minds podcast. You might remember Alistair from when I interviewed him before, or when I voiced an episode of Pioneers of the Continuum, a short series that Alistair produced. In this episode, Alistair and I workshop a story together. We start with the concept and brainstorm ideas to create a more interesting story. After our conversation, Alistair went away to write the story, we edited it together, and next week you'll be able to hear the recorded version. As part of this project, Alistair also interviewed me for English Learning for Curious Minds. We talked about my creative process and writing in general, and it's a really fun conversation. You can watch the conversation on the Leonardo English YouTube channel. This project allowed me to play a very different role than I'm used to. I'm usually the one in full creative control, so it was exciting to act as more of an editor. You can read the transcript for this episode at easystoriesinenglish.com slash together, or you can watch the video version on YouTube. Since it's quite a conversational episode and we talk faster than we do in our usual shows, I do recommend either reading the transcript or watching the video with subtitles. By the way, I have another live stream coming up this Friday at 6pm UK time. I had so much fun last time and I think you'll enjoy it too. It's a great place to ask questions and do some live story creation with me. You can find the stream on the Easy Stories in English YouTube channel, or you can always go to easystoriesinenglish.com slash stream to find out when the next live stream is. So, without further ado, here's my conversation with Alistair. Hi, Alistair. Hi, Ariel. Are you ready to do a bit of story workshopping together? Never ready, but let's let's start. Okay, so we talked a bit off camera before we started recording this, and we're going very broadly for the idea of someone who moves to London from a European country and they experience some culture shock. They experience some difficulties. So I guess, first of all, are we naming this country or are we going to make it ambiguous? Oh, good question. I mean, there are some universal peculiarities with the UK and with London, some things that I'm sure people from any country would find unusual. I would imagine for the listener to really believe in the character, it's probably easiest if we name where they're from. Mm -hmm. Because we could always do the thing where it's like, I come from Helgolandia and we make up a fictional country that we can, you know, be like, oh, well, in my my country, we do this and we just make it very silly. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it depends how fantastical we want to make the story. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I know <laughs> my preference is always to go like weird and funny. I, I mean, I, I also think it's quite like a common trope or theme in these kind of stories, right? The made up foreign country that like sounds plausibly European, but isn't real. But also I think it would, you know, it could also be more interesting if we do it realistically. I suppose we would have to choose a culture that we both feel pretty comfortable representing. Mm. So uh, I, I, li I like the fantastical idea. I think if we're choosing a culture that, that I have a good enough understanding of, that I kind of feel like I know what some of the main peculiarities would be. For me, it would, that would be probably France or Italy. If there's one of those countries that you feel like you know well enough that you would be confident writing about how it might be surprising for a French mm. or Italian person to arrive 
in London? For me, probably more France than Italy, but also, you know, I Germany, I have quite a few German relatives, um, Spain, I guess, as well. So, sorry, just to clarify, do, do you have a preference for the fictional, the real, or do you want to do a fictional country and take like cultural aspects from a real country? Maybe, let's make it more fun, do fiction, uh, completely fictional, fantastical, yeah. shall we? And yeah. m- maybe this this country can have some elements of, of all those different cultures, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I would say normally my impulse my first thought would be to go really far the other direction, like choose something so different, right? Like it's completely made up like, oh, in my country, we greet people by like hitting them on the head or something, you know, make it completely weird. But that can sometimes be offensive. Um, The reason I say that is because I, when I'm doing stories for beginners with the comedy, you're, you have to do quite like obvious comedy. So I tend to like really exaggerate. I'm not saying we have to do that. I'm just, that's kind of what I normally go for. So it, I'll leave the decision to you ultimately. Well, let, let me come back to you with an idea then. As you were saying that, I was thinking about somewhere that we both know, I would imagine nothing about, at least there are no people who live there. Uh, if there was someone who came from Antarctica, Mm, a, I love that. A small community had been discovered right at the South Pole. No one had ever found out about it before. And one person had been sent as a representative of that place to London. Perhaps we're telling, I love that. We're telling their story of, of the strangeness of this city. Is the South Pole, does it have penguins or is that just the North Pole? Or is the other way around? I always forget. Penguins just penguins. at the South Pole. In fact, there's also penguins in Africa. I believe because I, w- oh, I went okay. to um, I went to a zoo just outside Oxford and there were penguins there. And I thought that's a slightly strange place. And the person who was giving a talk was talking about all these other places that penguins existed, including, I think, parts of Africa. If I've got that wrong, oh, awesome. that sounds so stupid. But but uh, <laughs> but yeah, penguins generally at the that's, South Pole, okay. um, polar bears at the North Pole. But but I think I think Antarctica is a great choice because we're not going to offend anyone. And then also we can like, oh, we can have all this silly cultural stuff like, oh, well, you know, we, we live with penguins or whatever, you know, go, go a bit silly. We, we could also, it could be another fun element to add to it. Antarctica is claimed by something like 12 different countries, I think. So maybe you can have a fun mm. thing where you're right at the South Pole and I don't know, this person's recounting how their brother and sister are from Chile, but they're from Argentina and they've got a sister who's from Norway or something like that because they're, they're only just oh, yeah. a kilometer away from each other. Maybe that's an unnecessary detail to add, but... I, I think these are all really good um, ideas to brainstorm. I think we can kind of pick from them as we're going through, yeah. And actually what we just went through is a perfect example of, with writing often, not always, but often your first idea is not your best idea, right? Like, I think often when people have like the first idea for a story, we play it safe and then you can always stretch it to the limit. And then if there's a problem, you find an interesting solution. I'm really, really excited with this idea. Okay, They're coming to the UK. So I think maybe let's brainstorm like, what is weird about London and the UK for foreigners? I can think of lots of things. Yeah. (laughs) I'm trying to think of the kind of two, the two kind of levels of weirdness we can have. Because we can either have, mm-hmm. we can either focus on the fact that anything about any kind of non-Antarctican civilization will be strange for someone who has only ever experienced life in Antarctica, which presumably is is very odd, or whether we focus on the fact that there are unique things about London and about British culture that are strange. I think if if we're making it completely fantastical and funny. And almost like this person has come from another planet, has no idea about what life is like in a kind of a a developed city. Then you could always almost have more fun just talking about how completely different it is from the cold of Antarctica. And perhaps we can add a kind of Mm. secondary level is some of the more British cultural elements that might be weird as well. When you said that, I thought like, ooh, can we invert this? Maybe they're like staying with a a family or, you know, they have some people who are showing them around. And these people have thought like, oh, I'm going to show them all of the unique British things. Like we're going to eat pickled onions Mm. and 
we're gonna go Morris dancing. <laughs> Very weird <laughs> British things. But maybe the this Antarctican sees them and is like, no, that's that's normal, you know, like that oh, you know, yeah. we have that in my country. But then it's the normal things, like you ride on buses, like what's a bus that yeah. they find really weird? So it's like inverting the expectation. And you could maybe you could also have, I don't know, you could make fun of the fact that people in the UK go out wearing very little clothes. As what a lot of especially a lot of <laughs> Europeans think that when it's cold, people in the UK just don't wear enough clothes. There's people going out on yeah. you know, nights out wearing just t-shirts or women wearing just little skirts. Clearly this person from, from Antarctica, I imagine would think that's very strange because they go out wearing, I don't know, huge furs or, or maybe they also do that. Maybe they also go out wearing, wearing nothing and they enjoy the cold. When you were saying that I got a sudden image of like someone going clubbing where they're, they're, they're just wearing a big black puffer jacket and maybe they look like a penguin so maybe uh, yeah. this person like sees some like girls outside the club and is like, oh, they're penguins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so stupid. And you could also have, I think it's in, yeah, in Mary Poppins. When Mary Poppins and what's it called? Bert, the chimney sweep. They mm. go, they hop into the magical land and they go to the fairground and he puts his trousers down to his ankles and pretends to be a penguin. Can you picture that? They, they like he's waddling. He's waddling around, yeah. And yeah. They're, they're following the penguins. Mm. Maybe there's something similar we could do with that or or this person could find themselves at some kind of formal event and see uh, lots of british people wearing coattails and think they look a bit like penguins maybe um in their culture the penguins are either like very respected figures like the penguins like royalty or maybe they're like the enemies of the people and every time they see a penguin they're like i have to fight them and because of course you have penguins you have emperor penguins do you have king penguins as well i think they're they're king penguins too but you have you know various different degrees of penguins and perhaps this person could find it funny that i don't know you, you've got a king we we have you know we have tens of thousands of kings there are penguins um, <laughs> see this is what's so fun about brainstorming a story with other people is like you just get so many ideas i feel like yeah. i feel like especially if the audience for this story will be mainly non-british people then you know we mm-hmm. have to poke fun at the royal family because it isn't a very unusual thing imagine you know someone coming from the other side of the world and being told that there's this one family where the most senior person wears a crown and they get carried around on a gold chair i mean th- that is just strange so that's a easy yeah. easy subject to poke fun at is our antarctican going to meet the king do you think i'm not a royalist by any means so i would probably give a very offensive portrayal of the king um but <laughs> I, I don't know I if, it, if that's comfortable for you it, uh, it, yeah that, that's completely comfortable for me that could tie in nicely if we're thinking if we want to include the sort of the meeting of a person in like penguin tales i imagine the king's butler or servants on the way might be dressed in that kind of way maybe we could also talk about fish and chips because i imagine someone living in the antarctic eats lots of fish but probably doesn't probably has never had mushy peas and mushy peas might look a little bit like i don't know penguin poo or something like that so right well maybe they see all these vegetables and they're like oh green food it must be rotten and they won't eat any of it or something yeah 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 yeah, i like that yeah perhaps there's something to do with the seasons and when it's night and day it's clearly in antarctica it's unusual or maybe that's just a that's a distraction that doesn't really have anything to do with the uk well it raises a good question of um, the time frame of the story, because I'm guessing it's gonna, it's not gonna be over a whole year. I mean, if it happens in summer, they could be like, "Oh my god, it's so hot! Like, why is this country so hot? I'm melting all the time." Or something. Yeah, uh, I, I imagine we could do. Maybe this is even just a few days of this person. If we want to really convey these kind of experiences, this person goes through in detail. I guess we have to have it taking place in a week or something like that few days so i can think of a few ways to structure it one is that they move because they're like oh um you know the the economy the antarctican economy has really taken a downturn recently uh i guess maybe salmon prices have shot up or something Uh, we can come up with some joke for why the economy is doing so badly 
so they've moved to the UK for economic opportunities, but they find the culture so weird that they're like, I'm going home. Or another option is they've been sent as some kind of ambassador to Antarctica. Mm. And they're there to like open diplomatic relationships with the British crown and the parliament. Maybe they start off with a huge level of respect. And then after their visit, they come home and be like, they're, they're weak. We can send in the penguin armies and destroy them any day now. I, I, yeah, I, I like the the kind of uh, Antarctican economy is, is in trouble. But I guess it's, I, that might be difficult to reconcile with the fact that this person didn't know about the outside world before. Maybe... I don't know if I'm getting too caught up in this, but this idea of Antarctica being artificially divided into all these different countries, the UK, I believe, still claims part of it. So maybe this person could find out somehow that they are actually a British citizen and that they have a right to claim a British passport. Therefore, they're here. Mm. This person wants to free Antarctica from the British and they've come to try and speak to the king. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Almost kind of like a Pocahontas story. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and is it uh, this person that we're thinking this person is a human yeah so i was just thinking as you were saying like if this society has been hidden i guess it could be like the um indigenous societies in the amazon where they've just remained separate from like i guess our society or it could be something really silly like there's a secret underground world that the penguins have built and every now and then the researchers who come to the Antarctica, they drop a baby down a glacier and the baby like gets raised by penguins or something. So they know they have these parents who were these um, glaciologists from the UK who came to Antarctica and they're going to find their parents. That's Uh, another possibility. Yeah, maybe I'm trying to think if there's a way we can include like the expedition to the South Pole where there was the Norwegians, mm-hmm. uh, Amundsen, who won, and the Brits who didn't make it there and supposedly died. But I think they haven't, one of the bodies hasn't been found or something. So clearly you know a lot about the actual real history, which I don't, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So I think it makes sense to follow the history in some degree because you're interested in it. But I think that makes it very high concept, right? Like it's kind of a complex concept. So for the jokes to work... Mm. You have to kind of set that foundation of knowledge because otherwise people aren't going to, it's yeah, not going to yeah. be very funny because it's like most people don't know this stuff. But I think the only problem with that is that could make the story quite complicated and that's going to make it longer and kind of more challenging on a language level. You're right. Well. Okay. So maybe we strip back that stuff and kind of lean more into the fantastical element so that it's more universal. Well, the thing is really, I mean, I'm torn because it, it's clear, it's really exciting because I'm really lazy when it comes to research. So it's really nice to have someone who like knows all this stuff and I'm like, oh, it could could potentially make a really interesting story and give it some kind of um, depth in terms of themes and stuff. Mm. But then, then it's kind of ballooning in complexity. Yeah, I think for this scope, maybe we keep it smaller. Well, maybe you'll be inspired to write a novel afterwards. <laughs> Um, okay, excellent. So the things that we know we know for sure that we want to include someone from Antarctica who is a human. We figure out exactly why why they're there and how cut off they are from the outside world afterwards. They're coming to the UK. There is some kind of meeting with the king. We probably want to have a couple more cultural strange things. Yeah, something around food. I think the idea about the vegetables is a really nice inclusion. People know that fish and chips is a food that is associated with yeah. with with uh, Britain. A thing that seems to surprise lots of foreigners nonstop, not just Europeans, coming to the UK is flat beer, like ale with no with no fizz. Oh, so maybe right. you could have some kind of some joke that this person goes to a pub and orders a pint of ale. They kind of spits it out onto the floor because. They don't think it's fizzy. Yeah, and they could be like, oh, well, in Antarctica, we make alcohol from like Russian fish heads. So like, it just, you know, it just needs a bit of a, it needs yeah. a bit of a tangy taste, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Should we find something that is just completely the same, that might seem very strange to a European, let's say, or to a non-Brit about the UK, but actually is completely the same in uh, in Antarctica? I'm trying to think of what that would be. I mean, it could always be like norms around politeness, right? 
Because I know a lot of people be like, oh, British people are so polite. Or complaining about the weather, maybe. Complaining about the yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And and they're like, yeah, it's so annoying when you're like wrestling with a polar bear and then a blizzard happens and you get trapped in the wilderness. Oh, happens to me all the time. Yeah, yeah. Do we want to include any kind of language element? Or like, are we just assuming that this person from Antarctica speaks English? perfectly we could be really really cheesy and like on the flight he's like listening to our podcasts <laughs> but i i think that's a bit too like, i feel like that goes in in, in the no. c- category of just far too self-promotional maybe some of the penguins visit from africa that speak very good english and they teach the other penguins and this person english i don't know yeah i don't want to as you say don't want to try and make this too complicated and require too much background knowledge but maybe you could you could say something like, oh, no, there was an Englishman, some Englishman who came here in, in 1917 and they left a phrase book. And so for someone who does know the story, they're like, oh, wow, that's this people. And and if you don't know the story, it doesn't matter because yeah, because that's okay. We'll but, but if that happened, I think they would have to speak like a really old fashioned English. They would be like, how do you do so? Yeah, yeah. Very oh. good. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. Which might be difficult for learners if they're like less used to that old-fashioned english but if we explain it i think it could be quite funny yeah maybe you could have it because if we're if we're also thinking that after this workshop we'll go away and, and write the story and then we'll also perform it maybe one of us is the host the other person is the character do you think that could be a, mm-hmm. a fun structure so that there's kind of two characters i guess there's the there's the british character and there's the the antarctican character or were you thinking that yeah. It's a whole story where we say like, oh, and, and then this person did this rather than telling it in the first person. I generally avoid first person narratives at lower levels because it tends to be more complex language because it's more like introspection and personal thoughts. I guess we haven't decided language level. I'd also say in this, if you're doing like this kind of like silly comedy, third person works really well because it's just like a kind of typical format so the way we could always do it is if we did it in third person one of us narrates the story and then we do different voices for different characters okay um but actually that's a good question of do you want to aim at a particular language level or what are you feeling um i I don't know i know when i did my interview with you you said you always have a level in mind when writing it i think it's uh, the hardest bit for me seems to be kind of coming up with the the idea for the story and working out what should happen rather than the level i'm, I'm happy to go for whatever level that yeah. you feel I, i'm not sure if already when kind of workshopping these ideas you're thinking that's great for a, a beginner level or an intermediate or a advanced or i would say probably it's going to be like intermediate above just in terms of the complexity of the story and like some of the vocabulary we're bringing in okay but yeah because otherwise if you're doing beginner you might even have to explain like what penguin means and then at yeah, that point yeah. you're just explaining so many words okay so. yeah so i think that probably works um kind of intermediate to advanced cool. so if we did first person i mean it could work if we're doing this slightly higher level first person comedy tends to be funny because there's a mismatch between how the character sees himself and how the audience sees them like Mm. dramatic irony and i feel like that's not quite the kind of humor we're going for here yeah no and i I see what you mean okay it sounds good so i'm just looking at my notes we need to finalize the reason that they are going to meet the king i think maybe there does need to be some kind of diplomatic or official reason that they are going to try and meet the king maybe it's to maybe it's to free antarctica maybe it's to return the the phrase book maybe it's to go and do something that they had someone's been waiting a hundred years to do maybe they've they've found out there are penguins trapped in london zoo and they want them to free the penguins yeah that, that, that's probably that that's a good one especially at a, a kind of intermediate level i think because that's something that anyone can yeah. understand which, which idea interests you the most do you know i i i, I like this idea that we're uh that we're kind of involving the penguins a lot because people people yeah. clearly know penguins equals Antarctica. People know what a penguin is. Penguins look quite funny. I think you can make the nice parallel between kind of emperor penguin. Oh, we have, we have emperor penguins that we worship. You clearly have a king that you worship. And it's nice to see that there's the man who serves him also dresses up as a penguin. So he goes to see the king. He wants to talk to the king about this penguin 
who's trapped at London Zoo, trying to bring him back. And maybe the king insists that while he's here in London, uh, he spends, I don't know, 24 hours or something, understanding everything that the country has to offer. So he's taken mm. around and he's taken to have a traditional dish of fish and chips and peas. And then he remarks about the peas. Maybe he's talking about how they also eat fish in Antarctica. And they also eat it off old newspapers. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of complaining about the weather. I like this idea that he's he's speaking English from the early 20th century because of this phrase yeah. book. How do you want to kind of wrap things up? Does he does he go back with the penguin? Just before that, I, so we've got like, a lot of that is food and drink, right? There's like fish and chips, the pub. So okay. it'd be good to have like one or two things that are very much based around behavior, I guess. So maybe something about queuing. Yeah. Do you, know how, you know how penguins like huddle up for warmth? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's like trying to make them all like huddle up, but they're like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he sees people queuing and maybe that it could be something also about like hatching eggs. I don't know, because penguins are... The march of the penguins, right? They all like go on that long march. Yeah, 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 exactly. He thinks they're all going to give birth or something. March of the penguins, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to check. Emperor penguins are the ones with like the big yellow things I, on I, their I, head. I, uh, yes, I think they've got maybe even some yellow... A kind of V. Oh no, I'm getting confused. There, there's one that has this like big kind of yeah, like these ones. Oh, okay, what, yeah. One of these? I'm not sure because I'm just thinking it looks a bit like Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's something about this. Oh, that yeah, <laughs> just reminds me of Boris Johnson. I guess we'd have to, so, if we're not including any kind of visual aids, we'd have to rely on some quite advanced penguin knowledge. True. So apparently, this is called a macaroni penguin, uh, okay, which is see, a yeah, very yeah. funny name. Can you just check? Um, that yeah, there may... are king penguins as well. Yes, they look similar to emperor penguins, actually. Maybe the the character when he's talking to the king, he can say, "Oh, it's interesting that your king's uh, your country is ruled by a king, and ours, in fact, the king answers to the emperor, something like that." Yeah, or like, um, oh, interesting. So you're a kingdom, but have you ever had an empire? And the king's aid is like, don't talk about it. Don't talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. What other cultural things can we try and include? Because he's speaking this very like old fashioned 1917 phrase book. Maybe he thinks like British people, you know, when I learned English from my phrase book, I was told that everyone was very polite and that there were gentlemen and ladies. And when I came to the UK... You know, where's the culture gone? Everyone is so rude. You know, it's it's kind of a conservative idea, but you do hear people like Americans, for example, who are like, oh, the UK used to be so like proud and like British and now like everything is changing, you know? Mm. So it could be something like that. Maybe someone says like, oh, you're right, mate. And he's like, I am not your yeah, mate. I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, <laughs> I beg your pardon. Exactly. You're right, mate. Yeah, and then maybe he can say, excuse me, do you mean, are you okay, my good fellow? Or something like that. <laughs> and he's like trying to shake hands yeah. and say, how do you do? Yeah, and he's, I don't yeah. know, he's wearing a, maybe he's even wearing a top hat or something like that. We've almost got the re the reason to go and meet, go to the UK. He's meeting the king. We need to flesh out exactly why he's doing that. We've got some cultural scenarios that can be unusual for him. Do you think that sort of, that's enough for the short story and then we find a reason to end it does he go back with the penguin or stay in the uk or what do you think if i was writing it based on that the ending would very much depend on the tone that the story takes and i wouldn't really know that until i started writing i think should we leave this as a surprise for anyone listening yeah. Uh, why not? Well, well, also, you know, because you're going to write the first draft and then we're going to look at it together. But you're right. I think let's leave the ending and op uh, an open for the audience. An open book. OK, excellent. All right. I think we have lots of really good stuff that we can start putting together. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so I have to say it's 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 so lovely to um, brainstorm a story and then know that I don't have to write the first draft. <laughs> it's like, oh, I get to do the fun part and then you have to do the hard part. Yeah. But obviously we're going to work on it together. So I'm really excited. Well, yeah. I think we've uh, it's it's really interesting to see how how much we develop this just in the course of 40 minutes or so going from hmm, could this be a, a French person coming over? to work in the UK. Actually, no, it's someone from Antarctica coming over to meet the king and they might be speaking in old English and blah, blah, blah. That's, it, it's fun. Fingers crossed. Well, thank you, Ariel. I'm going to open up a Google Docs now and get started. Bye.
Unfortunately, my video cut off at the end there. I did actually say goodbye to Alistair. Listen out for our story, A Visitor from Chilly Bottom, next week, and make sure to go over and listen to my interview with Alistair on the Leonardo English YouTube channel. And just a reminder that there's a live stream this Friday as well at 6pm British Summertime. You can set a reminder for the stream at easystoriesinenglish.com slash stream. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider writing a positive review for the podcast on Apple Podcasts or like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Otherwise, see you soon!